It's going to be in Romans chapter 4, eventually. Romans chapter 4. Happy Thanksgiving week. Hope that the plans that you have made are all happy ones and that they'll come through and we get to spend time with family and friends. Enjoy a couple of days of rest and watching the Cowboys win and all the good things that go along with Thanksgiving. It's my favorite holiday. I don't care much for Christmas. Uh, my birthday just says I'm getting older, so Thanksgiving works for me. I, I wrestled this week with the text, and I think I have come up with uh, a lesson that is worthy of a Thanksgiving week. Hopefully it will send you away re-fortified and stronger in your faith and in your resolve and realizing what a great gift that we have been given. I wrestle with feelings of inadequacy. How many of you just, we want to be better. Right? We want to be better than we are. I've never been a trailblazer. I'm more of a joiner. Right? If there's something good that's going on, I can get with it. And a lot of times I can tweak what's going on and maybe make it a little bit better. But I would have been a terrible Apostle Paul to travel around and start churches. Can you imagine being the first one on the ground, the first one to talk to somebody about Jesus? I think when I look at you, that you've got more confidence than I do. I think that when you look at me, you kind of feel the same way. We all have that desire that maybe we could be more successful, that we could be more acceptable. And we put a lot of time and energy into those things. It starts in the family. You know, how do my family see me? How do, how do my parents see me? Were they proud of me? Did I make them feel good about having that son? It extends over into our school years, making friends. Some of us are pretty good at making friends, and some of us not so much. We were a little bit more loners, and we wished we would have been in the group, but we were a little too afraid to just walk over there and sit down with them and give them the chance <laughs> to tell us that they didn't really want us there. Later on, we'd get jobs, we have to get into a workplace and wonder if the people at the workplace are going to like us, if our boss is going to like us. If you live in a parsonage and you're a Church of Christ preacher, you're always one bad sermon away from being homeless and unemployed. So you want people to like you, sometimes desperately. But here's the good news for Thanksgiving week. If you're a person of faith, the only one who really matters thinks more of you than you think of yourself. He went out of his way to make sure that you and I could be with him. So think about all those people that you worried whether they liked you or not, whether you could sit down with them at school or whether they thought you were doing a good job on the job site or whether your parents thought you were the best child or the least child or whether they were proud of you or not proud of you. Our Heavenly Father loves you so much that he gave his son to be a sacrifice for your salvation. He wants you to have an eternity with him so badly that he gave up his one-of-a-kind son to make it happen. There are three major world religions that share a common thread. And all three show pride in their association with one man. Now, if, if they met in the middle of the Middle East, uh, these three groups might often be at war, either with all three being at war with one another or with two against one or whatever. But there are 3.8 billion people on the planet that count this one guy as being worthy of their adoration. Who's the guy? <coughs> Abraham. Abraham. The Muslim population believes that Abraham through Ishmael is their forefather. The Jewish community believes that Abraham through Isaac 
is their forefather, or through Jacob, is their forefather. The Christian community believed that Abraham was God's chosen one to bring forth a lineage that would lead us to Messiah so that we could have salvation. 3.8 billion people look to this one guy as being a father <coughs> of the faithful. So we're going to read all of chapter 4 and then talk just a little bit about what made Abraham so special and about what makes God so special in his relationship with us and use Abraham as our example. What shall we say? That Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to brag about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. <clears throat> However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from the works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We've been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited to him? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he made by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but had not been circumcised, in order that the righteous might be credited to them. He is also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but also follow the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. <coughs> it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and call things into being that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said of him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins, and he was raised to life for our justification. Is that a good Thanksgiving passage or what? We can celebrate the fact that no matter what we may think of ourselves, God loves us. No matter where we've been or what we've done, God loves us. He wants salvation for us. And what he calls for from us is to believe in the one that he sent. 
So the big question is, when did Abraham believe? When was it credited to him for righteousness? What did he do to achieve the righteousness, the justification that God gave to him? And the answer is, he believed God when God said, I'm going to do it. There are several passages, and if you start at about Genesis 12 and read through that section, you'll see these promises. God promised Abraham things like, uh, look to the north and to the south, to the east and to the west. Whatever your eyes can see, that's what I'm going to give you. Look up at the stars. As many stars as you can see. If you could count the stars, that's the way your offspring will be. Look at the sand. If you could count the grains of sand, that's how many your offspring will be. And Abraham worried about it. He thought about it. He considered it. I don't have any children. How am I going to have all of these offspring? And God just kept telling him, trust me, it's going to happen. Trust me, it's going to happen. And eventually, even after laughing, remember that story? God comes by, visits with Abraham and Sarah, and says, this time next year, you will have a son through Sarah. Sarah's in the tent laughing. Too hard to imagine what God could do. Did God do what he said he would do? Yes, he did. And so Abraham's faith that he was serving a God that could do what God said he could do, even though Abraham was not capable, even though Sarah was not capable, is the thing that brought him justification. Not what he did as a man, not what he accomplished as a human, but what he believed that God could do. And by believing it, God counted his faith as righteousness. Now, in the first century, when Paul was writing this, as a Jew and as a, uh, a man teaching some Jews and trying to encourage Jews to embrace their Messiah, he was talking to a group of people that counted righteousness in a different way than what Paul was preaching. Paul is saying what you need to do is believe that God can do what he promised. That's how God credits you with righteousness. The people, the Gentiles that are going to come in, they're not following your law. They don't need the law of Moses. What they need is the same faith that Abraham had, the same faith that God's calling you to have. The Gentiles need to have that same faith. But that's not the way that first century Jews counted righteousness. So let me explain a little bit why Paul is saying the things he's saying in this group. Level one was circumcision. On the eighth day, a boy child would be circumcised. If you were not circumcised, you were not a Jew, period, full stop. You weren't part of the nation until you were circumcised. So when people came in as adults and wanted to join the nation of Israel, wanted to be part of the Jewish people, the adult males had to be circumcised. And there was a big discussion about it in Acts 15. Do these Gentiles who are being uh, converted in Antioch and other places, do we need to circumcise them so they can keep the law so they can really be saved? And Paul says they believe that God will do what he said he would do. You believe that God will do what God said he will do. That's the end of the matter. They don't need to keep your law. They don't need to prove themselves <laughs> as human beings in order to get what God promised them through his son. And so here's Moses before his circumcision, trusting God and being credited as being righteous. Level two was law keeping. To be a better student of the law meant you were a better Jew. And to be a better Jew meant you were more righteous. So people would look at you, and if you knew more about the law than they did, they would count you as being a more righteous person. Here's something fun that, that happens when you're a preacher. People assume certain things about you and your lifestyle and what you like and what you don't like. And when they find out that you're kind of like them, it baffles them. And they'll say things like, I thought you were a Church of Christ preacher. You know, so how, how can you like this or how can you play that or how can you be involved with that? 
I thought you were a church of Christ. Well, their idea of what a church of Christ preacher is is completely ridiculous. Wherever they heard it, I don't know, but they've got an idea that somehow you're righteous because that's your job, to be righteous. Those folks in Paul's era would have thought him to be righteous, not because of his relationship with Jesus, but because of his relationship with the law. He had a doctrine in Old Testament. The guy was brilliant when it came to the Old Testament scriptures. And he keeps saying, I'm not righteous because I know the law. I'm righteous because I believe the lawgiver when he tells me <laughs> that he wants to have or that he wants me to have salvation through his son. Uh, anybody like the musical Fiddler on the Roof? It's a long, long some people can't sit all the way through it. But the lead role is a guy named Tevia. And Tevia is battling with things modernizing. And he's kind of an old school guy. But what he wants out of life, at least partially, is to be a rich man. And he sings a song. And I, if you can ask me later, I'll, I'll sing it for you. I know all the words. I was born to play Tevia and I've never had. So one of these days, I'm going to have to play Tevia. But he wants things like a big, strong house with roofs by the dozen right in the middle of the town, a fine tin roof with real wooden floors below, one long staircase just going up and one even longer coming down, and one more leading nowhere just for show. But when he finally gets to the point, when he finally figures out what he really wants out of life, he says, I would be at my leisure. I could discuss the holy book with the learned men seven hours every day. And that would be the sweetest thing of all. Because to be rich and to know the law, it just doesn't get any better than that. Paul's answer is, before he was circumcised, before the law was given, before Abraham had any children, he believed God. God counted that faith as his righteousness. Now, how does that have anything to do with us? Abraham believed that what God had promised, he could deliver. God had promised Abraham offspring. He had offspring. God had promised him land. He had lots of land and possessions. But God had promised that through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. It was 400 years after Abraham lived before the law of Moses was established. It was another 1,400 years or so after that before the seed came, before Christ arrived, died, was buried, and raised from the dead. Abraham didn't get to hang around to see all of the answers to all of the promises that God had made to him. But our God is a God that calls things that are not as though they are. So close to 2,000 years before Christ came, God said he was coming. Through your seed, <laughs> all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. And his saying makes it so. You know, our English Bibles begin with that promise. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. The Spirit of God was floating above the face of the deep. And God said, let there be and it was. Thousands of years later, Christ is on the planet. He says on God's behalf, they're going to turn me over to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are going to beat me up, and they're going to crucify me. But on the third day, I'm going to raise back to life again. He called what was not as though it was. And then it happened. He raised from the dead. So you and I, could have eternal life. So you and I could have the promises that God made so long before any of us were even thought about.
Verse 23 again. The words, it was credited to him, were not written for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins, and he was raised to life for our justification. We are righteous before God because Jesus gave his life for us. Happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy your week.